I'm Alex Michelson. Welcome to The Issue Is. Now, I hope and expect this to be the only time that I will speak to you in this manner. This week, it's almost Mueller time. Special Counsel Robert Mueller may not want to testify, but he will in a matter of days. California Congresswoman Jackie Speer will be among those asking questions, but first, she's standing by to talk with us. Then. Oh, no! Journalist Andy No was recently attacked by a mob of Antifa protesters causing brain damage. Andy here now to share his story and what he'd like to see happen next. Plus, our panel, Lisa Bloom, Sean Steele, Dean Shermay. The issue is starts right now. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson, and joining us tonight is Democratic Congresswoman Jackie Speer of California. She's a member of the powerful House Intelligence Committee and the Armed Services Committee. Congresswoman, welcome to The Issue Is for the first time. Yes, the first time. Great to be with you, Alex. Uh, so let's talk to begin on the issue of citizenship. There's been this big debate about whether the question of are you a citizen would be on the census or not. The president saying that it will not, but issuing an executive order about the citizenship issue. Here's what he had to say. I am here by ordering every department and agency in the federal government to provide the Department of Commerce with all requested records regarding the number of citizens and non-citizens in our country. What do you make of that? And uh, do you think that, are you concerned about a potential national database of, you know, citizenship information? Well, I must tell you, Alex, when I was listening to him, I was shaking my head thinking, is this the beginning of a police state in this country? Uh, this is a, a president who hates to lose, and so uh, he is now attempting to, um, you know, get it another way, and yet those are not documents that are necessarily all uh, co coordinated and then uh, put into a huge database. So, yeah, I'm very troubled by it. Uh, the question becomes, how is he going to finance that? Because it's going to take time and effort, and uh, I, he doesn't have the authority because that comes from the Congress. So I don't know how much of this is face saving or how much of this is something we should be very concerned about. But doesn't he have a right to know who's a citizen and who's not a citizen in this country? I mean, the citizenship question was asked on the census decades ago. Well, it was uh, up until 1950 when it was discontinued. And it was discontinued in part because we weren't getting an accurate count of everyone who was living in the United States. Well, let's talk about another issue, which is the issue of Robert Mueller's testimony before Congress. You are going to be one of the members of Congress who have an opportunity to actually ask him questions under oath. What do you want to know? What's your question? I think my number one question would be how much of your investigation was hampered by the fact that uh, WhatsApp and other encrypted uh, messaging uh, centers were used by those that you were uh, looking into. Mueller has suggested that his report is his testimony. He has nothing new to add. What are you expected to gain out of this? So the report is over 400 pages. I would venture to say most Americans haven't read it, and frankly, um, they shouldn't be required to read it. Uh, I think by his testifying, we're going to be able to shine a bright light on that report. Even if he does nothing more than read from that report, it's going to provide greater clarity to the American people. Are you expecting that this will change the impeachment calculus or potentially put more pressure on Speaker Pelosi to bring up the impeachment inquiry? I don't believe that it's probably going to change the calculus in terms of impeachment. You know, time is running out to really process an impeachment um, inquiry. That doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, actually do the uh, groundwork in terms of asking the questions. Uh, let, let's talk about another uh, big issue right now, which is of concern to so many Californians, and that is what's going on at the border, the border detention facilities. I know you're going to visit these facilities, as so many members of Congress have. We've seen protesters at different congressional offices around California saying that these detention centers need to be closed. Do you think that they need to be closed? 
Absolutely, they need to be closed. I made a trip to McAllen, Texas and Brownsville uh, last year about this time. Um, I took some 23 members of Congress. Uh, we're returning there this year with about 20 members of Congress, and I am uh, concerned that what we're going to see is that the numbers of those crossing the border, uh, moving through these detention facilities have only grown. What we do know is that virtually everyone that comes across this border seeking asylum has a sponsor in the United States. That sponsor has to, by credit card, um, pay for a bus ticket for each of the people in that family to go to the sponsor's location. Um, we should move that process along much quicker. We do not need to spend a, a lot of money, as much as $700 a day, to house people in what are extraordinarily poor conditions. So is your suggestion essentially, instead of staying in those detention centers, they should be staying with sponsors? That's right. Now they get an ankle bracelet so you're able to determine where they are. They have a date when they've got a return for their asylum hearing and uh, that is the way we should be doing it. That's how you comply with the law on asylum seekers. Um, let, let's talk uh, for a moment about the issue of gun control, uh, which I know is really personal for, for you. Um, many of our viewers in Northern California know your story really well. Some of our viewers in Southern California may not know your story as well, um, it, it, which involves Jonestown. You actually went there with a member of Congress who was killed in this. You were shot five times. Of course, 900 people there ended up committing suicide. Uh, back in 1978. For you, is the issue of gun control especially personal, and how has that experience shaped your perspective when we bring up guns so often in Congress now? Well, of course, it affected me personally uh, and profoundly. Um, I am you know, very scarred um, in my, around my body, and um, it's a daily reminder. I think about all the others who have uh, been victims of gun violence, have survived. Uh, they're scarred for the rest of their lives. I carried the assault weapon ban in California uh, many years ago, and I was able to use my personal experience to make the case that uh, being shot by an assault weapon um, has profound impacts on one's physical and emotional life. So we go from that, which is the heaviest experience possible. Uh, I know you've never been on our show. We like to have a little bit of fun. So we play some games. This is called Either Or. And this is where we ask you a few questions that are fun, light. You can pass if you want to. But these are a, a few either or. You pick either this or that, OK? So we get to know okay. you a little bit better. All right, all right. you ready? OK. First one I'm is ready. beach or mountains? Mountains. Giants or A's? Oh, come on, Giants. Steph Curry or Clay Thompson? Steph Curry. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Dine in or take out? Hmm, take out. And finally, dogs or cats? No oh, dogs. All right. Hey, you didn't pass. We're on getting it. a new puppy. Oh, you We're are. getting a new puppy. What yes, kind? tomorrow, as a matter of fact. What kind? It's a golden, a golden doodle. Oh, God, those are cute. Our, our yellow lab of 15 years uh, passed on just three months ago. Oh, sorry to hear and that. We're, Do, we're homeless and homesick. <laughs> well, we also like to play some music on this show, and your choice is a little Aretha Franklin. So, sock it to me. Why, why this? Oh, come on. Spell it out. <laughs> well, you got a chance to dance to a little Aretha. Congresswoman Jackie Spear, thank you so much. I like you're moving a little. I like it. Oh, I'm, I'm moving a little bit. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard to do with this in Statuary Hall, you know. Yeah, sock it to me, Congresswoman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for being here, Jackie right. Spear. From Southern California to the Bay Area, you're watching. The issue is. Oh, yo! Journalist Andy No was attacked recently by a group calling themselves anti-fascist demonstrators. This happened in Portland, Oregon. No suffered a brain hemorrhage in the incident. A young man who just got slugged, viciously slugged. I think it's a disgrace. Do you ever notice they pick on certain people? Andy is an editor at the Quillette. He joins us now to talk about that. Andy, welcome to The Issue Is. Thank you for having me on. First question is, how, how are you feeling? 
better than before. You can see on my face that uh, the bruising and swelling has gone down a lot. I'm just focused on the next step of recovery because I've um, de been dealing with the brain injury. And, and that's a look at some of the initial injuries from that incident itself. So take us back to that day. There's this protest happening. Antifa organizers are doing it. You've covered them many times before. You thought about wearing a helmet and then said, I'm not going to wear a helmet because I don't want to draw attention to myself. You're in there. The protest is happening. You got a GoPro. What happens? When we were in the heart of downtown, steps away from the central police precinct, the sheriff's office in the in the middle of the day, this mob felt emboldened to attack me, and it was completely unprovoked on my part. It was a, the first contact was to the back of my head, very hard. I'd never been in a fight. It took me a few seconds to realize I was even hit. I didn't know really what had happened, and before I could center myself again to the ground, the punches kept coming from every direction. Um, they ripped my earlobe during that attack. I was bleeding, I was dazed. And when I thought they were done, then the other people who were cheering them on started pelting me with eggs, objects, milkshakes, uh, right in the face, to the head. So I couldn't even see which way to leave. You had covered them before. You think that you were targeted because of that? Oh. Most definitely what had happened is weeks before this demonstration, Rose City Antifa had put out a uh, post naming me and rallying for people to come, promising physical confrontation. That was the word they used. So these people call themselves anti-fascists. We have uh, seen them many times in California. We've been out covering them. Some of them have been nice to the media. Some of them have been very nasty to the media, me included, and some of our reporters included as well, in, in a way you don't often see. Um, you have seen sort of an outpouring of support, not only from those on the right, really been adopted by those on the right, but some on the left as well. When you hear Joe Biden, other people coming to your defense, what, what goes through your mind? I have a lot of gratitude. I think some people have asked me, are you upset that not more Democrats have come out? I'm not. I know uh, it's unfortunate that some have turned this into a partisan issue when it's not. Would you go back? Would you cover more Antifa events? Was this worth it for you to do this? It's not worth it to suffer a brain bleed. However, what I've been focusing on since the attack is continuing to speak out, as difficult as it is, because I want the public to face the brutality of this movement. You've been described a lot in a lot of the media as a conservative journalist. I know you don't like that label. Uh, you prefer not to have labels. But I I'm interested in your background because you're Vietnamese, you're openly gay. How would you describe your political worldview? So I'll borrow a uh, some of the language from the progressives. My lived experience informs a lot of how I cover Antifa in the columns that I write, in the features. Uh, my parents were refugees to the United States from Vietnam, and they have actually lived through a Marxist revolution. So these masked individuals, most of them, I would say actually all of them, are uh, middle class white people who have no idea what it's like to actually live through a communist revolution. My parents did, they suffered political persecution. My father was sent to re-education camp, my mother labor camp when they were very young. And so that, that type of trauma was something that they passed on to their children, my, my sister and I. And that informs my coverage of far less militant movements. So what do you want people to take away from your story? Because some people in your situation may not be speaking out now, because in some ways it's putting more of a target on your back, potentially with these people. Um, but you find it important to speak out on shows like this. What, what is your main message? Well, this is not just a story of one journalist getting beaten. It's a warning. Um, Portland is a, is a harbinger and a warning to cities across this country of what happens when, for political reasons, politicians are handcuffing police and turning a blind eye to far-left militancy. Well, we're sorry that you're suffering. Um, but we're grateful that you're speaking out. We're glad that you came on the show today. And uh, I know you probably haven't had a lot of time to smile or to have joy in the last uh, month or so, but you know, we do like to play some music on this show. So we asked you for your music choice. I was surprised by it. 
It's the Carpenters. Why the Carpenters? That, that was music that my mother liked before 1975, after the communist reunification of Vietnam. Western music, pop music was banned. Uh, and so this music was taken away from my mother when she finally found refu political refuge in the United States. This was music that she played for my sister and I. So it has a lot of meaning Absolutely. on the Carpenter song. Well, thank you so much for joining us on The Issue Is. I'm glad we could bring you some music <laughs> as you. well. Andy No. It's a pleasure. Thanks so you. much. Up next, our panel on, the, on a whole lot, including border detention. Stay with us. Last week's show was preempted in Los Angeles because of the 7.1 magnitude quake near Ridgecrest. We had just finished taping the show before that quake hit. And our guest, Democratic Congresswoman Katie Hill, talked to us about her push for federal funding of an earthquake early warning system. This recently passed the House, but still needs to pass the Senate. I think it's something that we all know how important it can be to have an alert that's just a few seconds uh, in, in advance to be able to stop trains, to be able to you know, stop traffic lights, to, uh, to make sure that people, we have an actual chance to save lives. Now, during our personal issues segment, the Congresswoman shared her favorite song, which is Everybody by the Backstreet Boys. And who can forget those dance moves, right? You don't do, want to do, see do you do their dance move? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what was it? What did they do? I can't remember. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. A lot to react to with our panel with us, Dean Shermay, Sean Steele, Lisa Bloom. I know they're feeling, they're already dancing. You got the whole thing ready. Stay with us, more of the issue is coming back. Come on, you can, you can go and compete with them. I'm yeah. so bad. You can show, oh my God, Dean's ready. There we go, okay. Tough to compete with Dean. That panel getting into it. Former professional dancer turned chef Dean Shermay. We also have attorney Lisa Bloom and Sean Steele of the Republican National Committee. Things got heated between them when we started discussing those migrant detention facilities. We've had these activists saying we need to shut down these camps. Um, Sean, Sean, what do you think? Is it time to shut them down? Are, are you embarrassed by what you see? The entire crisis is completely phony because the Democrats discounted it for two years, it's saying there was phony. no crisis, this, and now okay. it's a crisis. Okay. You, you can't know, explain that okay. with a straight face. I can't explain it because these camps are run by the Department of Homeland Security, which is accountable to the Trump administration. We're talking about soap for children. We're talking about toothbrushes and toothpaste. This is not a dollars and cents issue. This is a crisis in moral leadership. This is a humanitarian crisis that the Trump administration, who is now accountable for these camps, has created and frankly refuses to fix. There's people that are at the border that it's our responsibility to, if we are going to process these people, we need to have them in humane conditions and process them accordingly. I don't know exactly what the solution is, but right now what's happening at the border is a complete disaster. Remember, the, the children in the cages and those pictures liberals are using, blaming Trump, those are Obama cages. This is the those are Obama. Don't, don't disagree with the yeah. obvious truth. No. Obama those, those put in the cages Sean, originally. Those pictures came yeah. from the, the, from the, the, the government. The, the Democrats are constantly you know, changing the, okay. the rules. And it, uh, there's let, a lot of let, yelling, let's but let if I could get a word in here. You know, Trump wants to blame Obama. He wants to blame Nancy Pelosi. If it's true. And, and, okay, he is in charge now. He is responsible for this. So clearly they're divided on policy, but united in their love of the Backstreet Boys, right? There. You can watch that full show right now. It's quite a debate. It's at youtube.com slash Alex Michelson. Streaming right now. You can also stream a special podcast with Dean Shermay about food, fitness, family, and of course, politics. In fact, all of our previous shows are available in podcast form. Just search for The Issue Is wherever you podcast and please subscribe. We'll be right back after this. If there was a viable chance, I would not be standing here today. You know, I, I would, from day one, was running to win. So I have no, no regrets. I'm excited about what we've done. California Congressman Eric Swalwell said bye 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 to the presidential race this week. So it's time to introduce a new issue is game. It's called Politico Bingo. Swalwell is our first X on the board as he's the first out of the race. So you can play along with us at home in the coming months. But don't be alarmed. We still have 25 candidates left because billionaire Tom Steyer entered the race this week. Remember when he was on our show? 
and he told us that he wouldn't run for president? Well, now he is. And I was surprised by his campaign intro video. I thought that Tom Steyer's voice would start it out, but another voice did that sounded kind of familiar to me. Tom Steyer, one of the most influential activists in Democratic Party politics. Yeah. Thanks, Tom Steyer, for watching The Issue Is. <laughs> Thank you for watching as well. So as we say hello to Steyer and goodbye to Swalwell, we bring in the Beatles for a little help as we say goodbye. Have a great weekend.